Marena Aldo po kaninyong amin. A pleasant day to all of you. Welcome to Human Stories. My name is Dada Dokot, an anthropologist of my hometown in the Philippines and the Filipino diaspora. I investigate themes including the circulation of care and solidarity among Filipinos extending beyond borders. Today, I will discuss the spread of community pantries in the Philippines, a transnational mutual aid movement emerging amid the COVID-19 pandemic. What can we learn about humans from community pantries? What can we learn about a highly transnational people ruled by a violent political regime in this post-colonial pandemic times? To answer these questions, I will first describe the context of suffering during the pandemic in the Philippines, then discuss government and public responses to community pantries, and finally, report on our experience of organizing a community pantry in my hometown located in Bicol, Philippines. I will argue that as coming together in solidarity exemplifies generational memory built into the consciousness of Filipinos surviving multiple colonization, violent dictatorial regimes, and recurring calamities, so is the government crackdown on the community building efforts and public perceptions about Filipino indolence. Post-colonial governments in service to capitalism enact colonially inherited carceral logics that criminalize solidarities and resource sharing. On April 14, 2021, artist Anna Patricia Non set up a small cart with free food for the taking at a street corner in Metro Manila with a sign that translates to, give what you can afford, take what you need. Inspired by Non's simple act of generosity, donations poured in, in the form of cash, food, and essentials. About 900 community pantries have popped up all over the Philippines as of June 5. The Philippines is experiencing the second worst COVID surge in Southeast Asia after Indonesia, logging a daily average of about 5,000 positive cases in June. Families relying on cash remittances from relatives working abroad are in trouble, as over half a million overseas Filipino workers have been repatriated to the Philippines upon losing their jobs. The pandemic highlights the vulnerability of the political and economic structure of the Philippines that largely depends on migrant remittances, foreign investments, and foreign aid. The bulk of overseas Filipino workers engaged in so-called elementary occupations earn $350 to $400 a month. As migrants are often burdened by loans to pay back, little is left for cautions that could be used in emergencies, including the current and anticipated large-scale public health emergency. Lockdown, sanitation, and quarantine regulations implemented since the pandemic start remain inconsistent, if not absurd. In our recently concluded interviews with 50 overseas Filipinos affected and displaced by COVID-19, repatriated workers testified about their turbulent experience of being locally stranded. Government loans for COVID-19 response have already ballooned to 15.49 billion US dollars, but the rollout of vaccination has been slow. Government support for businesses and citizens has been the least generous regionally. Groups are lobbying in the Philippine Congress to approve a 200 US dollar cash subsidy for families in need, but the government has indicated that delivering cash aid is currently not a priority. Unemployment in the Philippines is high at 8.8% or 4.5 million. Insecurities felt during the pandemic are additionally compounded by extrajudicial killings under Duterte's war on drugs. The climate of fear grows as the police commit senseless killings. The Philippines slipped in the global happiness rankings, reflecting the effective toll of the drug war and the pandemic on Filipinos' well-being. Mass-based community pantries emerge in the Philippines within financial, political, and health insecurity and crisis and safety. Programs that build infrastructure remain weak, while labor outsourcing companies such as call centers mushroom in cities. The lack of support for developing livelihood programs in the countryside also leads to the sustained movement of people to the cities, which means that the surplus of fungible workers also grows. Business owners increase their profit by keeping labor costs low and by keeping workers in a state of limbo, by not awarding them regular employment contracts, 
which means they cannot get salary increases and health care benefits. This labor situation is perfectly illustrated by the so-called 555 system of contractual employment, where Filipinos' labor contracts are renewed every five months, a month away from being regularized as stipulated in the law. The community pantries movement in the Philippines serves as an avenue for learning about the different ways that humans act during a time of crisis. One would think that there would be an overwhelming sense of acceptance of the community pantries, especially within conditions of food insecurity, but it was not the case. In the Philippines, red tagging is the malicious calling out of individuals as communists. In a country where there is a culture of extrajudicial killings and online trolling, those who are red tagged receive threats or actual harm both online and in real life for their supposed communism. Preoccupied with profiling activists and organizers, the Philippine Congress held a hearing focused on community pantries on May 19. The Duterte government and its supporters have accused pantries as a front of the Communist Party of the Philippines as they were concerned with Non's photo in which her clenched fist was raised. Another set of responses to the community pantries are accusations related to perceptions of the so-called Filipino indolence. Critics of community pantries repeat claims such as, we have to teach poor people to survive by not giving them free food, that the poor expect freebies and do not want to work, that the poor should be given seeds so they will have food to harvest later. Now, these discourses about the myth of the lazy Filipino native must be unpacked, especially during food, during food scarcity and when any kind of aid could be life-saving. Such statements unfortunately echo racist stereotypes crafted by colonizers that harmed Filipinos histor historically. German explorer Fedor Yagor, traveling in the Philippines during the Spanish colonial period, lamented that Filipinos were not interested in supplying the European market. Not wanting to build and participate in labor for the metropole, Filipinos were thus deemed naturally lazy and wasteful of resources. In the U.S. colonial archives, Filipinos appear as, they, as if they needed to be rescued from the deadly sickness that indolence was perceived to be. Filipinos were evaluated against the racial and colonial capitalist metric whereby their labor was only valuable if they fueled the circulation of capital and generated profits for empire. Jose Rizal, a writer and scientist during the Spanish colonial period, wrote extensively to debunk the myth of the indolence of the Filipino. To illustrate his point, Rizal tells us about the fable of the gardener who tried hard but failed to raise a tree in a small pot. The gardener attributed the failure to the plant which he thought was from a weak species. However, Rizal argues that the gardener did not see that the failure of his venture lies in the lack of soil in which he tried to nurture his tree. Taking this story in understanding the root of the so-called indolence of the Filipino, Rizal argues that education and liberty serve as the soil and son of mankind, and that without these two that nourish the minds of people, there can be no true reform. The shift to cash economy and aspirations for modernity have pushed farmers to sell land, thus forcing them instead to work typically as tenants to landowners. Take the case of Jessa, one of the tenant farmers that I interviewed. After harvest, Jessa is entitled to only one sack out of every 11 sacks of unmilled rice, which she will split with her farming partner. This means that four or five days of Jessa's labor totals to less than $2 per day. Let us return to Rizal's argument that Filipinos need education to be truly free from the shackles of oppression and consider the paradox of aspirations for education among people with little capital to fulfill aspirations for upward mobility. In my research, Filipinos who identify as poor try their best to invest in education. However, to attain aspirations for the next generation's upward mobility through education and professionalization, lands are often leased or sold to those with capital. 
without capital to sustain expenses for education, descendants of farmers would find themselves completing high school and training and proceeding to apply for work overseas as caregivers, domestic workers, and other low-paying occupations. Towns like my hometown thus progressively become what Nefertita Dior regards as places where cheap sources of labor are warehoused, in collusion with wealthy nations needing cheap labor. The Philippine government overlooks the need to invest in local infrastructure and return land to the dispossessed. Laws for returning land to the agricultural poor were passed in 1987, but the rich still hold on to vast agricultural lands. My friend Elaine Villarasa, a grade school teacher, sent me a message on Facebook on April 17 that we could also try to set up a pantry in our hometown. Elaine also invited local village official Baluman Lanit to help set up the party. We combed our respective local and transnational networks to invite others to join our cause. We collected a total of $1,544 for the community pantry, funds that allowed us to open for 15 days. 81.15% of the donations received were from diasporic Filipinos, mostly residing in the U.S. 11.53% were from Filipinos living in the Philippines. Finally, 7.32% were from non-Filipinos. The importance of the diasporic giving is manifest in this small example, but it is also important to note the in-kind donations delivered to the pantries locally and the gift of labor given by local volunteers to set up the, pan the pantry. The militarized management of the pandemic in the Philippines under Duterte is failing at its quarantine regulations and policies. The Duterte government has shown a lack of care for its citizens by barely providing life-saving aid, aid to stimulate the economy. Politicians and supporters of Duterte engage in the unproductive red tagging of community organizers instead of addressing immediate needs. Community and mass-based responses to the pandemic have shown us that humans organize themselves to survive through collectivity and mutual aid during disasters. Amid the pandemic, emerge a people coming together to redistribute the resources, exemplifying generational memory built into the consciousness of Filipinos who have survived 400 years of colonization, turbulent post-colonial regimes, and endless natural disasters. Donations to the pantries are made mostly anonymously, countering politicians' actions grounded in promoting their name and in accumulating prestige and personal gain to perpetuate their position. The expression of care and the critique of patronage politics increasingly occur on the transnational level. In contrast, the government is, is preoccupied in suppressing collective action, even if benign and needed in these distressing times. The Duterte regime's efforts to chip at solidarity work reenact the Philippine colonial government's memory of criminalizing and incarcerating efforts that build communities modeling the sharing of resources. Politicians have accused community pantries of violating quarantine and sanitation regulations. Additionally, criticisms about the supposed indolence of the marginalized recipients of community pantries is a post-colonial tragedy that shows increasingly atomized post-colonial Filipinos echoing the myth of indolence ascribed by colonizers on Filipinos whose labors they saw as valuable for as long as they fueled imperial and capitalist desires. Accusations about laziness show the erosion of practices of care, reciprocity, and accountability in increasingly atomized communities. I would like to end with happy conclusions about how humans make sense of a turbulent world as seen in the community pantry's example from the Philippines. Mutual aid make visible the kindness, work, and energy of people during the times of need, as conversely, it highlights government inefficiency, tendency to be self-serving, and to be in service of capital as it enacts inherited colonial carceral logics. 
there's also something to learn about the structure of inequality that humans navigate every day from the community pantries. The flow of dollar donations to our community pantry and the purchasing power of those dollars make visible to donors and organizers the materiality of global inequality. 70 US dollars can buy a spread of vegetables, enough to feed about 30 families for a day. Personal donations to sustain community pantries eventually run out. When pantries finally close, people are confronted with a painful fact that their taxes paid while working locally or fees paid to be granted permission to work overseas aren't used to address the needs of Filipinos, even in times of dire need. They become aware of the tragedies of disaster capitalism that allow states to gather aid and secure investment deals on their behalf, only to deploy these to fund a militarized response to the pandemic, while barely considering the general public's welfare. Maraming salamat. Thank you for watching. I hope you found my presentation useful. Please check the other video presentations at www.humanstories.ca for more stories. Thank you. Peace and light to you and yours. So, I, I, you know, I sometimes do this and do that.